Welcome everyone to the Grinded Podcast. Nipsey Hustle is going to bring us in just a little bit with grinding all my life. All my life, been grinding all my life. Sacrifice, hustle paid the price. Want a slice, got to roll the dice. That's why all my life, I've been grinding all my life. Yeah. It's time to hit this rail we call life and grind it. So we're talking about this prayer of Jesus, the greatest prayer that was ever told in in John 17. And we talked about in the last podcast how Jesus is he's praying to the Father. He, he looks up into heaven, toward heaven, and he, he starts praying to the Father. And he's asking for the Father to be glorified and to get him home. And he is uh, begins to pray on these, these 11 disciples that are left because Judas has gone off to betray Jesus. And so we got down to verse 9. And Jesus says in verses 9 through 12, he says, My prayer is not for the world, but for those you have given me because they belong to you. He's talking to the Father. He says, Father, you've given me these guys. and They belong to you. All who are mine belong to you. You have given them to me, so they bring me glory. Now I am departing from the world, and they are staying in this world, but I am coming to you. Holy Father, you have given me your name. Now protect them by the power of your name so that they uh, will be united just as we are. During my time here, I protected them by the power of the name you gave me. I guarded them so that not one was lost except for the one headed for destruction. Talking about Judas, as the scriptures foretold. And so here is the heart of Jesus' prayer. He flat out says, he said, Father, I'm praying not for the world, but I'm praying specifically for these 11 men that are about to build my kingdom. They're going to take over because I'm leaving and I'm coming home. I'm going to be coming back to you, Father. And so he mentions a couple of of specific things. He says, number one, Lord, Father, he says, protect them by uh, the power of your name. Now, can you imagine? You go back into the Old Testament and you, you look at the names of God uh, all the Jehovah, Jehovah Nisi, Jehovah Jireh, just so many uh, different names of God. And, 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 and you think about how powerful God is. And, and Jesus said, you have protected them uh, by the, by the, or you have protected me by the power of your name. Now protect them by the power of your name. And then he says, uh, he says, so that they will be united just as we are so jesus says that he, uh he protected them during the past three years uh, that that's uh, when his ministry started he went around and handpicked these men and told them he says follow me and jesus says he's protected them but now that he is leaving he's asking god the father to protect them as well and what's interesting is in jo- uh, job uh, chapter 1 verse 10 we see where God had put a hedge of protection around Job. He says, have you not put a hedge around him? This is Satan talking to God because Satan is, is looking to and fro on the earth to, to somebody who he can you know, wreak havoc in their lives. And God has said, have you considered my servant Job? And, and, and so this is what Satan says to, to, to God. He says, have you not put a hedge around him and his household and everything that he has? You have blessed the work of his hands so that his flocks and herds are spread throughout the land. But the devil is the devil saying, I can't touch Job, God, because you have put this hedge of protection around him. And the minute that God took away that hedge of protection, Satan literally made his life a living hell. And so I told you in the last podcast, my prayer time is uh, when I'm going to work to my first stop. And I got about a 40 minute drive. And, and one of the th- things that I pray on a daily basis is Lord put a hedge protection around my family and keep us safe as we go and do our jobs or we go to uh, to a school you know, or whatever my, my family's involved with for that day. Lord put a hedge of protection around us. Just keep us safe. And that's what Jesus is asking God to do for these these 11 disciples that are left. He's asking for God uh, to protect them uh, because they're going to be working for his kingdom. They're going to be taking over in his place since he's fixing to die on the cross and be resurrected back to the Father. And so Jesus is asking the Father 
They have work to do, God. Please uh, protect them. Keep them safe. Now, here's a question for you. Does this mean that you know, you know, even though I pray for protection every day over my family and, and for God to put a hedge of protection around me and, and my kids and my wife, does that mean that nothing bad's ever going to happen to us? Absolutely not. Uh, even though I, you know I don't want anything bad to happen and I want God to protect us, it does not mean that nothing bad is going to happen. I mean, there, evil does exist. And, 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 you know, things happen. Uh, if you think about these disciples, uh, even though Jesus himself, right here in the midst of these men, is praying for God to protect them, look what happens down the road. They, they, they start being persecuted. Then they start getting beaten for their faith and for teaching in the name of Jesus. And, and the next thing you know, uh, in, in uh, Acts chapter 12, the, James, the son of Zebedee, the brother of John, is beheaded. And Peter was put in prison. He was next. He was going to be killed. But the angel came and rescued him. Look look at what happened to Saul or Paul. Uh, that, that guy just was beaten so many times and, 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 and was chased around. People tried to kill him all the time and, and, and shipwrecks. There's all kinds of bad things happen uh, to Paul. So just because we pray for God to protect us doesn't mean that he, even though he is protecting us, and, and, and here's the great thing about it, if we're in Christ and something does happen to us and it takes our life, well, guess what? We get to go, like Jesus said, Take me on home, Father. Let me be with you in heaven. And so we do pray for God's protection, just like Jesus prayed on, on behalf of these men and their protection. But things still happen to them. Uh, evil still exists. Things happen. Life happens. People die. I mean, it's just, it's just, a, it's just the way it is. That's just life. And so, but we should still, I want to encourage you to still pray for God's protection. God put a hedge protection around uh, my friends, put a, protect, a hedge protection around my family. Lord, keep us safe and Lord willing that he will. And the second thing Jesus prays for is, is unity. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time here uh, on, on this because we just covered this in a previous podcast but I, I do want to mention a couple of things about unity. In, in the book of Acts alone, in one accord, talking about unity, in, in, talking about the church being in unity, it's used at least 10 times. And You can do a word search on unity, and you can see how crucial that unity is to uh, the, the church. But before leaving this thought on unity, I, I want to point out that there is power, and I mean absolute amazing power, power in unity in acts chapter 4 peter and john they've been questioned by the authorities about uh preaching and teaching in the name of jesus and they've been told not to do it at this point that's when the persecution began but it hasn't gotten to the beatings just yet and so they go back to the brethren they go back to the church that has started and they tell the church what had happened and when they had heard what had happened, they raised their voices to God with one mind in unity, and and they they say a prayer to God. And you can read that prayer if you want in Acts chapter four. But at the end of that prayer, that prayer that was said in unison or in unity, in verses thirty one and thirty two of Acts chapter four, it says, "When they had prayed, the place where they had gathered together was shaken." And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God with boldness. And the congregation of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. And not one of them claimed that anything belonging to him was his own, but had all things were common property to them. Because they, they, they shared, they, they pulled all their money, they pulled all their belongings together, and they had to to survive. And, and they, uh, when somebody had a need, they, they met the need. But my, my point, in point uh, to tell you those verses of Acts chapter 4, 31 and 32 is how their, their prayer in unity produced this great power that the place that they 
were in shook from the power of God and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and they were given such great boldness to proclaim Christ and his message. That's awesome. Uh, and I, I pray, you know, our churches today, are, they're, 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 they're so divided. Even you know, we got all these denominations and even within the denominations, you got five more different kinds of flavors of that denomination. And it just wasn't that way. And when the church began in Acts chapter 4, there was one church. There's one God, there's one Lord, there's one Savior, there's one baptism, one, one, one. And, and, and we have to be in unity. And when there is unity, there is great power in that unity. So uh, Jesus continues with his prayer in verses 13 through 19. And he, he says, now I'm coming to you. And he's talking to the Father. I'm coming to you. I, I told them many things while I was with them in this world so they would be filled with my joy. I have given them your word, and the world hates them because they do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. I'm not asking you to take them out of the world, but to keep them safe from the evil one. They do not belong to this world any more than I do. Make them holy by your truth. Teach them your word, which is truth. Just as you sent me into the world, I am sending them into the world. And I give myself as a holy sacrifice for them so that they can be made holy by your truth. We'll break down that part of the prayer when we come back from break. My name is Dinah Grace Hawk, and I started a movement of empowerment. I focus on Revelation 12:11, which states that we will overcome, conquer, and defeat him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. And we will not love our own lives even unto death. See, sharing testimony squashes pride. It empowers, it strengthens, it encourages, and it heals. This whole movement is focused on sharing our testimony, our walk with the Lord, how He's using us in this life to empower others to do the same. By doing this, we will overcome anything that this world can throw at us because we are covered by the blood of the Lamb. Every week from now till the end of the year, I'll be highlighting a different woman in the ministry, and they're going to share their testimony. Tune in every Saturday at 7 p.m. Eastern, either on Facebook or Instagram at Dinah Grace Hawk. And you get to be a part of this movement, too. I'll see you there. Jesus says that these 11 men, they, they don't belong to the world just as he doesn't belong to the world. And, and what he means by that is that he has gone to each one of these men individually and he has called them to follow him. And, and, and they have. They've given up everything. They've given up life as they knew it. They've given up their jobs. They've given up their family to follow this guy claiming to be the Son of God or claiming to be the Messiah. And since they have taken on this challenge, Jesus said the world hates them just because it hated him. And he's inside or going to be inside them by the power of the Holy Spirit. And he tells the Father, he says, protect them because the world is going to hate them just like the world hated me and throughout this study of john we have seen and it, it and this is what has amazed me in this study and doing these podcasts is just how much people hated jesus and not just the religious leaders but your average ordinary day person they just did not like jesus they they many of them did but a ton of them didn't like him they wanted him gone they just they couldn't grasp him even though they were looking for the messiah and so Jesus says, I was hated, they're going to be hated. And so he asked the Father, he says, to, to sanctify them or to make them holy. And, and the Greek word here is hagiazos, which means to, to be set apart for a holy purpose. It's where we get our word saint. When we become a follower of Christ and, and we are washing the blood of Jesus and we're filled with the Holy Spirit, we have literally been called out of the world. Uh, I believe it's in Colossians where uh, Paul talks about how God has literally t taken us out of the kingdom of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of light. Just like that claw machine. When you go into a store and you put your money in and that claw comes down and grabs a toy, it picks it up out of that pile of toys and it brings it over to this hole and it drops it if you've picked one up and it goes through that hole and now it's in your hand. It's, it's been transferred. And... and, and that's what this word sanctified means, that God has taken us, 
through the power of Christ, and he has taken us out of the world of darkness, and he has washed us and made us clean, and he's filled us with his Holy Spirit, which is Jesus living inside of us, God the Father himself living inside of us, and we have a new purpose. We have been made holy. We are We have been set apart for a holy purpose. And, 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 and so that, that's what he is telling the Father in this prayer. He says, Lord, they, they have come out of the world. They have believed your message. They have accepted it. And now they have, I am setting them apart. They have, they have given up their life. They have given up everything that they have known to follow me and to follow you and to do your will and, and to do my will. And so he's, he's saying protect them as they do this will, as they do your will, Father. Make these guys holy. And he says, make them holy by your truth. Teach them your word, which is truth. And, and, and just like the disciples were set apart, we are set apart by the same way, by the word of God. And that, that's why it is so crucial that we are students of the word, that, that we read our Bibles. Uh, so, uh, well, Romans chapter 10, verse 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. I mean, how do you get to know somebody? You spend time with them, right? And that, that's the only, the best way to know Jesus and to get to know Jesus is to spend time with Jesus. How can you spend time with Jesus? Well, through prayer. But if you really want to get to know Jesus, you get into the Word. Because that, is, that, that, that tells the story of Jesus. It tells us what Jesus is like. And if we want to get to know Jesus, we have to be in the Word. In 2 Timothy 2.15, it says, Paul says, Be diligent. Uh, King James says, study to show yourself approved to God as a worker who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth. You see, when we read our Bibles, whether it's, it's just a few verses to get started, or if, it, if it's a chapter, or if you can memorize chapters, if you can memorize verses, if, if you could just, get, just immerse yourself in the word of God, because when, when you do that, the more you're in the word, the more God speaks to you, the, the more you hear from God, and the more you you see Jesus, it, 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 that's why it's called a, the living word. Because you can read a verse, and you can turn around and go read that verse again in a few days, and you'll, you'll see something totally different that you didn't see the first time. When you read a passage in the Bible, and if you go back and read that po uh, passage in a few days, you'll something will jump off that page that, that, that you didn't get the first time you read it. And, and so... And people say, well, I, you know, I would read the Bible, Randy, but I, it's just too hard to understand. Well, let me tell you this. Let me encourage you to do this. Go get you a, a, a version that you can you can read and understand. Um, the NIV is one that a lot of people use. I, I don't really like the NIV because it, it takes some verses out, some crucial verses. Uh, we used to have a joke in, in Bible college. We call it the non-inspired version. But if that's all you got, that's all you got. And a lot of people like it, and that's okay. It gets the job done. The, the central message is there about Christ. Um, but I, I, I preach out of, well, when I do preach and I do these podcasts, I use the New Living Translation uh, because it, it's an everyday language. And, it, it, and uh, as far as I know, there's there's no verses that has been tampered with or taken out or, or anything like that. Uh, but it, it is an everyday language and it's easy to understand. Uh, and I know the King James, if that's what you have and it's, you can't understand it, believe me, I understand it, uh, what you're saying. Um, but, uh, get whatever version you can, uh, read and, and follow and, and comprehend. And not only that, but before you read, just pray to God and say, God, give me understanding what I'm about to read. I want to know you more. I want to be closer to you. I, I want to be more intimate with you. And as I read these passages, Lord, help me to understand. And he will, he will give you understanding. I promise. He will give you. He will open up your eyes and your heart and your understanding. Now, I want to get to one of the coolest parts of this prayer, and that's in verse twenty and twenty-one, because Jesus mentions us two thousand years ago when he's praying to the Father in front of these disciples. 
He says, I am praying not only for these disciples, talking about these 11 men that are still standing there with him in this room. He says, I, I'm praying not only for these disciples, but also for all who will ever believe in me through their message. That, that's you and me. Because we, when we read the word of God or we hear a preacher preaching out of the word of God, we're hearing the message that they wrote about Jesus, right? And, and he says, I, I, I'm praying for all of those who will hear their message and believe their message. He says, I pray that they will all be one. Talking about you, you, and, you and myself. That we will be one. Just as you and I are one. As you are in me, Father, and I am in you. And may they be in us so that the world will believe you sent me. <clears throat> and that, that, that's key. That's crucial. Because when we claim to be a Christian and we claim to follow Christ, we should be different. And we have been called out of the world. And we, have, we are being made holy by the blood of Jesus Christ. And so we have a new purpose. And that new purpose is to produce fruit and grow the kingdom of God. And, and so he prayed for our behalf, on our behalf that we would be unified and that we would be in Christ and that we would continue to show people Jesus, to, to do his will. And, and I, it's just amazing to me that Jesus, on the night before he is going to the cross, he knows what he's about to face. Uh, the beatings before the cross and the pain trying to breathe on the cross for six hours as he hung there. He prayed for these 11 disciples and he prayed for you and me. He prayed for you and me that we would believe their message. And once we believe that God would protect us and keep us and that we would be in Christ and be in the Father and that we would be doing his will. And, and that, that just amazes me that he would think of us as he's about to face such a cruel death. But he did. And that just shows you his love. And speaking of love, that's what he prays for in the next few verses. In verses 22 through 24, he says, I have given them the glory you gave me, so they may be one as we are one. See, there's the unity thing again. I am in them and you are in me. May they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me and that you love them as much as, I, as you love me. Father, I want these whom you have given me to be with me where I am. Then they can see all the glory you gave me because you loved me even before the world began. And so here, Jesus pleads, uh, pleads for not only for unity, but love. And I just talked about love in a previous podcast and how this love is an unconditional love. He, he wants his followers, his disciples to experience the Father's love love he wants us to be where he is in heaven and and he loved us so much john three sixteen, that, that he gave us jesus to die on the cross to pay the penalty for our sin that's the kind of and there, that, that love is unconditional now salvation as i said in, in a previous podcast is conditional because we have to do something to be saved we have to believe the message and we have to follow christ and we have to continue to follow christ but his love is unconditional. And Jesus is saying, I want them to experience you and your love. And, and think about God. And, we, you know, we can't even understand, begin to understand God. Uh, he's all powerful. He's everywhere. He, he's all knowing. He knows what we're going to say before we ever even think of what to say. He knows what we're going to say. And, and in Psalm 139, verse 6, David says, such knowledge about God, such knowledge is too, too wonderful for me. Uh, it's too great for me to understand. And that's why Jesus came to this earth as God in the flesh, so he, the, he could reveal God to us. And that's exactly what he did. He has revealed the Father to humans. He has showed us what God is like. And that's why when, when Thomas says, show us the Father, and Jesus says, hey, you've seen me, you've seen the Father, because I'm the exact representation of my Father. It's just I'm in flesh so that you can, you can see how God is like and you can understand how God is like. And so Jesus says, I want them to experience your love. And I'm just going to be honest. 
when I hear God loves you, I, I have uh, sometimes I, 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 this doesn't register with me very well because uh, people in my life that say they love me and turn around and they, they've hurt me. And, and, and so sometimes I experience that kind of love when I hear love with pain. And, you know, so I kind of draw back. I, I draw away from people who say they love me because, uh, I don't know, you, you know, I don't want to be hurt again. And so uh, this unconditional love that God has, and, 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 you know, my dad died of suicide, so I, I never uh, never knew my dad, and I had a, a, a stepfather who, a stepdad who was uh, abusive uh, verbally and, and, and physically, not sexually, but physically, and uh, never told me that he loved me. I think he might have told me once or twice at the most uh, when he was my stepdad for 23 years. And so I, 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 this, this is a hard concept for me to even teach on because I really can't grasp it myself. But I do know that God loves me so much that he sent his only one and only son to die for my sins and he paid the price for my sins and it's an unconditional love and that's what I can share. Um, and so I know that God loves me and I know that he's always going to be here for me because he says I'll never leave you nor forsake you. And it, he'll be the same way with you. And Jesus pleads for us to experience this real love, the love that God has for us. But notice what Jesus said about the love the Father has for him. He says, they, they can see all the glory you gave me because you love me even before the world began. And, and Jesus is claiming deity here. He's claiming to be God, which he is God, God in the flesh. And he is saying that he was with God in heaven before time and space began because he was there when the world was created. He was there before the world was created because he created the world. And you can see that in Genesis chapter 1, John chapter 1, and in Colossians chapter 1. And that, that's a, a whole deeper subject for a, a whole other podcast uh, on another day. But Jesus finished his prayer, his prayer to the Father in verses 25 through 26. And as he is about to, to head out, because right after he gets through praying, they leave for the Garden of Gethsemane, where he's going to be betrayed and that, that, uh, by Judas, and that little militia is going to take him uh, to the, the religious authorities to be handed over to be crucified. And so he ends his prayer by saying this. He says, O righteous Father, the world doesn't know you, but I do. And these disciples know you sent me. I have revealed you to them, and I will continue to do so. Then your love for me will be in them, and I will be in them. That was his last plea. That his disciples will continue to learn about him. And as they continue to learn of him and about him, that the Father's love for Jesus will also be in his disciples. And I want to end this podcast by asking you this question. How do you love? How do you love? Can people see Jesus by the way you love? John 13, John 13, 15, 35. John 13, 35. Jesus says, your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. How do you love? God bless. Thank you for listening to the Grind It Podcast today. You can send any questions or comments to grinditpodcast at gmail.com. Please join us next time. And when a challenge comes your way, just grind it. Been grinding all my life. Sacrifice. Hustle paid the price. Want a slice. Got to roll the dice. That's why all my life. I've been grinding all my life. All my life.